Let me take you back to the 21st of December, 1972. In Chile, something extraordinary happens. We have film of what very nearly amounts to a real miracle. Two men, who the world had written off as dead, walked out of a snow-covered mountain range and into the world's attention. Survivors of a plane crash in the Chilean Andes, the plane went down 10 weeks ago. The 45 people aboard were given up for dead. The two brought news. There were others who made it as well. They'd endured temperatures as low as minus 30 degrees centigrade, and they'd had to resort to grim, desperate measures to pull through. I say to Nando, nothing is left in the, in the, in the little chocolates. And Nando told me, Carlitos, I'm going to eat the pilot. So who were this group? How did they survive? And what could we all learn from their story? You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Luke Jones. Today, why we ate our friends, the story of a plane crash. I'm Blanca Schofield, and I am the assistant culture and books editor at The Times and The Sunday Times. So how does someone with that job title end up doing a story about cannibalism in the 70s? I was sent an email a few months ago about a new film that was coming out about this plane crash, and I'd never heard the story before. And this is a, a film, a dramatic film, based on a book. Yeah, so it's based on a book by this Uruguayan writer called Pablo Vierci, who grew up with a lot of the survivors. He went to the same school as them, and he was also friends with a lot of the people who died in the plane crash. Let's talk about the story itself, then, that all of these things have been based on. It was a flight. From where to where, when we're we talking? It's the 12th of October, 1972, and there is a group of young men in their late teens and 20s, and they're flying from Montevideo, which is the capital of Uruguay, to Santiago in Chile to play a rugby match. They charter a small plane, and so there were going to be 45 of them on board because it's the people who are going to play this rugby match, but then also some friends and family. So what should that flight have actually looked like and what, in the end, actually happened? You fly west for about three hours from the east side of South America to the west across Argentina. But then they were forced to stop in Argentina due to bad weather. But the law at the time dictated that they couldn't stay there for longer than 24 hours. And so the next day, even though it hadn't fully cleared up, they had to take off again on Friday the 13th, which apparently some of the rugby players were actually joking about <laughs> the kind of unlucky significance of that date. And so then they took off again, and that's when it all started going wrong. And how, how did it go wrong? They're nearing their destination, but there's cloud cover and the Andes are obscured, and also there are two pilots and the co-pilot isn't very experienced, so he's being trained. So he thinks they've arrived at the point where they're then going to cross the Andes and start their descent into Santiago. But actually, he is mistaken, and they haven't actually gone far enough to start that crossing. And so they start descending, and they basically realise that they're going into the mountains. And so suddenly all the passengers are seeing these mountains get closer and closer. Especially as in you, when you come through the clouds as well and all of a sudden that becomes clear. Exactly. So then the weather is already bad. There's loads of turbulence. Then they try and lift up the plane and kind of almost go vertical. To try and get over the mountains. To try and go over the mountains. And it doesn't work. The You know, they can hear the engine screeching, the plane shaking. And it seems that what happened is that it clipped the mountain two or three times. So one collision took the right wing off, another one took the tail section off, along with the back seats. And two crew and three passengers were sitting there and died when that section was lost. Mm. Then the plane hit the mountain again, the left wing came off, two more passengers fell out, and then the remaining chunk of the plane fell 700 metres down uh, the glacier at 200 miles per hour before stopping in a pile of ice and snow. And then, obviously, some of 
the people who survive that crash end up in the sort of main body of the fuselage that's left. And you've been speaking to actually one of those people. Who's that? Daniel Fernandez Strouch. So he's 77 now and he was 26 when it happened. Hola, mucho gusto. Desde donde me están llamando? Desde Montevideo. Soy el mayor de todos. When he was rescued, he really just wanted to get on with his life. Mm. Like, if you meet him, he's a really stoical person. He's very friendly, but he's very matter-of-fact. When I returned home, everything was the same as when I had left. I got married, graduated from agronomical engineering and started working. And I said, well, that story is over. So he didn't really talk about it for the first 30 years. And then in 2002, in the 30th anniversary of the crash, all of the survivors, they set up a website called Bibin, which means they live. Mm. basically telling the story of what happened to them. And they started getting loads and loads of messages from people who were suicidal, who were saying that their story was really inspiring them. They said, my lot is insignificant compared to what you are going through. Our story was helping. And so then what he said to me was, this is why I survived. I survived to tell the story and help people. Let's get to how they survived then, because where we left the story was that the plane has crashed, various bits of it have been ripped off as the crash has happened, but we've ended up with the fuselage, and in the fuselage, 45 people were in that plane originally, now it's, what, how many people are alive and injured? 12 died immediately, and then five more died overnight or in the next day, so then there are 28 survivors. What happened to the pilots? They're among those first 17 people who died. One of the pilots died immediately and the co-pilot was trapped in the cockpit. He asked for his gun and he actually asked one of the passengers to shoot him who declined to do that and then the co-pilot died in that first night. Hmm. And where where is the plane? I mean, I'm, I'm picturing like a, a valley or is it on a side of the mountain? So they're in the Valley of the Tears, which is sort of the side of a mountain in the Andes. They're 3,700 metres high, three times the height of Ben Nevis. The heavy snow, the whiteness of the snow combined with the sun can leave you blind. The depth of the snow when they don't have any equipment. They're at minus 30 to 35 degrees centigrade when it's at its coldest. The altitude sickness that you would get up there is immense because of the low oxygen levels. So even moving around or even standing outside when you're getting used to it would be so difficult. Mm. And also, growing up where they did in Uruguay, a lot of them had never even seen snow before. And now all of a sudden they find themselves surrounded by like miles and miles and miles and miles on all sides. And as you said, minus 30 degrees at points. So what do they, this 28, what do they actually do? What Daniel emphasised to me is you have to imagine the teamwork mm. in this situation. We had a brutal trust in each other. And if one person did something wrong, like if he didn't make enough water, he'd apologise that night in the fuselage. I only ever saw that in the mountains, someone confess a wrongdoing when no one else had noticed. They organised themselves under the command of their team captain called Marcelo Pérez. So there were two or three medical students among the people who were on board. So they obviously quickly had to start treating the wounded, including one called Nando Parado, who was actually in a coma. So, you know, setting broken limbs and tourniquets, bandaging... Other things that they had to do was start melting snow so they'd have water. They had to create more of a shelter, so they decided to stack up all the suitcases so that they would be blocked out from the cold at night. So then during the night they had to jump on each other, punch each other, make sure that they didn't fall asleep because if they did, you would potentially die and then they would have to do some of their sleeping during the day. Was no one trying to find them at this point? Obviously... A huge search operation Mm. ensued. There were teams from Uruguay and Chile and Argentina, and they 
were flying around the area trying to find them. Some actually did fly directly over the wreckage, but they couldn't see the fuselage against the snow. Oh, because the plane was white. Exactly. And they described the absolute desperation when you see, because they could see the planes flying over them at times Mm. and knowing that they're not seeing them and feeling like you're going to get rescued, but then they don't actually come down. Did they try and make themselves more visible? They did try and make themselves more visible. So they wrote SOS in lipstick on the fuselage. They also built a cross in the snow out of bits of the wreckage and suitcases, but even that didn't work. And so what happens with that search operation then when I imagine they have, what, a few days of no luck? So it was called off around 10 days into them being on the mountain. Hmm. But the survivors who were in the fuselage at that point had a radio that they managed to get working. And so they heard on the radio that the search operation had been called off. And that's when something clicked in a lot of their minds. We have to get ourselves out of here, basically. And if this is 10 days in... How have they been surviving up until that point? What have they been doing? So, like even just in terms of food? They just did have very little of it. They had to ration the supplies they had. So they had eight chocolate bars, a tin of mussels, three small jars of jam, a tin of almonds, a few dates, some sweets, some dried plums and several bottles of wine. And Nando recalls keeping a chocolate-covered peanut and basically surviving over that one peanut for three days. But you know that that food's going to run out. Mm. So then aside from that, when they start to get more desperate, they start trying to eat parts of the plane, like the seat stuffing and shoelaces. And then obviously they know that this isn't sustainable. Mm. So then they have to start considering the, the unimaginable that everyone is thinking, but you don't want to voice, which is engaging in cannibalism and eating the bodies of the people who died. And does that really become an option? Not just obviously when they realise that they're running out of the little bit of food they had, but also the fact that now they've heard through the radio that the search has been called off. Yeah, so up until that point it had kind of been gingerly discussed. So Mm. there was kind of this like varying attitude towards it where some people were like, we're going to have to do this. Others were like, I absolutely cannot do this. But then when on the radio they heard that the search was called off, there was kind of a change in attitude and it was like, we do just have to do this. Because they've got the bodies of some of the people who died just, what, around them, in the fuselage with them, so it is there, staring them in the face. Exactly. Some of the bodies are inside the fuselage, some of them are outside in the snow... Daniel said, when we heard the news on the radio, everyone made the pact of mutual deliverance. Meaning what? This is what we're going to have to engage in. But also, something that's really, really important about this story is that even the people who hadn't died yet agreed that if they died, their bodies would be used for this. So there's actually a letter preserved in Montevideo in Uruguay written by Gustavo Nicolic before he died, where he wrote, if tomorrow the time comes where I can help my friends with my body, I will do it with great happiness. So what you're seeing here is a situation where these kind of conventional rules about what we eat and what our morals and what our ethics are no longer apply. Hmm. It's not this gross Lord of the Flies situation where everyone's turning against each other and like using each other in this really gruesome way. It's this actually beautiful gift of generosity. But then how does this sit with a group of people who are religious? I mean, we know that they're from the Uruguayan Old Christians Rugby Club. They'd pray together in the fuselage, passing a rosary around. So how does it sit with them on that level? So the way a lot of them describe it is they saw it as Holy Communion. And actually one of them could only really start to engage with it when they saw it like that. Yeah. And were they even, like when they discussed it with people that were very injured or dying, I mean, do we know how those conversations went? Yeah, so for example, they started to have a bit of gallows humour. The eldest survivor, Javier, he said, if they hadn't used me if I had died, he would have come back from the dead to give them a kick where it hurts. (laughs) And then the quote is, because I believe that to be used as food would be the ultimate sign of love for a close friend. Mm. And amazing to have such a sense of humour about it Yeah, exactly, exactly. So then they would take a bet on who would die first and then they would tell people... 
not to die because they were too skinny to be useful as food. But that did make it slightly easier, potentially, and slightly more manageable. But then there were people who couldn't keep it down and who did still really struggle with it. When they actually made the decision to actually start eating the flesh of their deceased friends, how did they actually go about it? Because even just cutting bits of the, of the flesh must have been quite difficult with having no tools, I guess. Yes, yeah, so they used broken glass and they would cut, like, small matchstick-sized pieces and cover it with snow to, to hide the taste. They would also leave it out in the snow to let it dry. Oh, in the sunlight. In the sunlight, because apparently that also made it more palatable. And then as time went on, they started thinking more about nutrition and the fact that they couldn't just eat the meat. They would also, in order to get the nutrients they needed, they would have to eat the bone marrow, they'd have to eat the organs, and eventually they also had to eat the brains, which they did by... um, cracking open the skulls with an axe. And it's still, I mean, it's hard to reconcile that with what you were saying about them still being very respectful of each other. I mean, how on earth do you do that in a way that isn't totally gruesome? So actually, Daniel was one of the three who was in charge of it, him and his two cousins, because he was actually on the flight with two cousins. It was the most difficult job, but someone had to do it. More practical steps they took was they would have the faces turned to the ground. Also, three of them were in charge of cutting the meat. It's not like they were all doing it. I'd grown up in the countryside where we're used to the cutting up of an animal carcass. This was something that is done every day. So I think, you know, it became a kind of way of life. They must have started to think, well, no one's going to come and save us. We know at least one rescue attempt has been called off. So do minds turn to how do we get out of here and, you know, not just wait for someone to come and rescue us? Yeah, and that had occurred to them before. So Nando Parado, when the search operations had initially been called off, he already was thinking about this, but this was now just even more of a reality that they were going to have to help themselves and, and walk out and find help. Also have to remember that in this part of the world, yes, it's November, but that means that it, it was becoming warmer because it's the Southern Hemisphere. And so it would potentially be easier to do the expedition. And how do they decide who is actually going to go and try and break free? They can't all do it, surely? No. So, because they would also run out of meat and mm. it would be suicidal. So they picked the strongest three. So when did they set off? They wanted to go west to Chile, but the almost vertical mountains were in the way. And so they set off, these three, they set off east on the 17th of November. But then they actually encountered the tail section of the plane. Hmm. And in there they found some more food. They actually cooked some meat by lighting up some cases that had held Coca-Cola. And they slept in the tail. But it was much colder than sleeping in the fuselage, so they weren't going to be able to do that. You know, they weren't going to be able to survive there. So they decided to go back to the fuselage and bring some of the supplies that they had found. Which must have been really dispersing for those there thinking... You know, here they come back, they've clearly failed. Yeah, exactly. But they just had yeah. to deal with it and start again. How did they How did they find the, the society in the fuselage when they got back to it? Someone else had died, a man called Basque Echevarin. They also didn't bring back any bodies. They didn't find any bodies when they were, in the, when they were beside the tail of the plane. And the people who were at the fuselage as well... They'd started seeing vultures that were coming. Like, this is some really vivid stuff. They'd started seeing vultures that were trying to kind of get at the bodies. And then also they were trying to, they were struggling to keep the bodies covered in snow. So not only are they in the situation where vultures are eating some of the bodies they have and that they haven't been able to find any more ones, the impetus for having to try again to go on another expedition must have grown stronger. Exactly. Like, as it was getting warmer, it was harder to preserve Again, I hate to use the word, but this meat, more people were dying, more people were unwell. 
more people were going to get sicker as well as as the temperature gets warmer because bacteria can thrive more when it's not so cold. Yeah. And Numa Turgati, who had been someone who had put so much, so much effort in and had really, really tried to survive and help everyone in the group, he died on December 11th. And Fernando Parado's belt had run out of holes. He couldn't make any more holes. So they were just losing so much weight. So it was kind of like, we have to do this. It's now or never. So a month on, they decide to make a break for it again. How do they approach this differently to last time? The key point is that they had found some insulation material in the tail of the plane, and so they actually sewed a sleeping bag out of this, and that meant that they wouldn't freeze to death. But what other kit did they have? Absolutely no proper mountaineering kit, but they had multiple pair of jeans, multiple jumpers, rugby boots... One of them didn't even have rugby boots. They had socks that they would wrap in plastic. They had a compass that they'd removed from the plane's instrument panel. They also made snowshoes out of cushions. And then they also packed um, some meat in, in socks. Yes. What route did they take? So on December 12th, they set off and they just walked straight up the mountain. And apparently the survivors in the fuselage could see them for three days. And what was that journey like? They have all of this clothes on, all this weight, and they have to stop every 20 paces to catch their breath because the air is so thin. Yes. That then became every 10 paces. Because you were saying if they were starting at an altitude which was three Ben Nevises and they're going further up, so the altitude must be incredible. Exactly. It's altitude and also it's so steep, so they were also worried that they would kind of topple backwards, mm. like off the side of the mountain. What happened when they reached the top? Obviously, you're hoping to reach the top, look over the side of the ridge and see civilization. Yeah. But what they saw at the top was just more and more mountain ranges covered in snow. So they realised that not all three of them will be able to continue because they don't have enough food because they're probably going to have to walk more. So one of them went back to the fuselage and the remaining two, Roberto and Nando, they started heading towards a valley that they thought they could see. But actually descending was even harder than climbing. And so apparently the first 50 feet took them four hours. And when did they first feel like they were making any kind of progress? After descending, they finally found the mouth of the valley they'd seen from the top. And they hit a river, Hmm. which they could follow. And also they saw a lizard, which would have been the first living thing apart from these vultures and birds that they'd seen in ages and Mm. then they saw some cows and if you see cows it means that someone's looking after the cows and when did they see those people so on the ninth day of the expedition they saw a mule driver when i first saw them i was walking on my way to gather the cattle i thought they were tourists he was on the other side of the river but they started screaming and screaming at him across the river But then they started running, trying to get to a place where we could talk. So I stopped and went over. They gestured with their hands, but I didn't understand. And he shouts back, tomorrow. Mm. And they're thinking, oh God, I hope he comes back tomorrow, because if we get here and we don't get saved, it's going to be so frustrating. And he does come back the next day with other men, and throws across a paper and pencil attached to a rock and they write down explaining who they are and the man throws them some food. Then two hours later, a mule driver appears on their side of the river and Roberto, who is really, really unwell at this point, is loaded onto a horse with the man and Nando walks beside him and they're brought to a log cabin. Hmm. And incredibly, the media are... There almost immediately. Yeah. So the next day they show up at the log cabin that they're being sheltered in. And the news was broadcast around the world. And so, for example, one of the journalists says, I'm from the BBC in London. I would love it if you could give me a comment. And Roberta says, what for? And the reporter says, because this is a one of a kind story, all the world wants to hear about it. And this is an incredible journey when you just look at it in the whole, what they did to get from the crash site to there. Exactly. They'd walk for 10 days across the Andes with no actual snow equipment, Mm. surviving on the most minimal rations of human meat. And they'd also climbed 4,650 metres without any gear, which is about three and a half times 
Ben Nevis. And how long after the crash is all of this? I mean, what's the length of the full ordeal? So it's 70 days after that they're rescued. And so now I guess the mission is get help back to however many people are left at the crash site. Yeah, so there are 14 people left at the crash site. They need to be rescued immediately because many of them are at the point of death. And with the radio that they have still, I mean, would would they have heard about the news that their friends actually made it? Yes. Daniel, who I spoke to, he would, I mean, they would all listen to the radio, but he specifically heard that two men had been found coming out of the mountains. Mm -hmm. And then he heard the Ave Maria play and he felt that it was his friends and that they were and that they were saved. Why the Ave Maria, I don't understand. It's a religious song, it's a very traditional Catholic song. So what did they do to prepare then, thinking, right, help is likely on the way now? Daniel runs back and says, and starts shouting, they've made it, they made it, and and they were so excited, and then they had to start preparing mm. because they were about to be rescued. So um, they started cleaning their teeth, which were rotting because of scurvy. Mm. One man tidied up his hair with hair gel um, and shaved, despite having no soap. So things return to a bit more normality than they had been living through. It's almost like straight away they they started behaving as if they were back in normal society. So when the rescue actually came, how how did it happen? So Nando, who is one of the two men who hiked out with the expedition, is asked to guide the helicopters back. And it's going to be a really difficult flight because it is, as we've established, a dangerous place to go to and especially in a helicopter. And the air is so thin and turbulent that even these really experienced rescuers struggle to reach the men. Hmm. And Nandal's in the plane saying, I'm sure it's in this location, I'm sure it's in this location. And actually some of the rescuers on the helicopter are like, it, it just is impossible for it to be there. And he has to keep insisting, like, no, I'm sure, I'm sure it is there. And you can imagine uh, in the fuselage, all the survivors are following this really intently because all the, every minute of, it, of the rescue mission is being broadcast live and then finally they see two helicopters arriving. And how do those rescuers reflect on what they saw when they got there 70 or plus days into this society having lived there? It was the home that they were living in, but obviously they were having to look at it with new eyes and they saw it as the kind of, as they describe it as the pigsty that it had become because, you know, there were human remains. It obviously had like a very strong stench. And after, again, 70 plus days of this, did the people being rescued adjust to this? It was a process of adaptation. So one of them describes instinctively reaching for like a strip of, of the meat instead of the coffee and chocolate and tea that the rescuers had offered them. Hmm. Apparently when they landed, he was offered a flower by a friend and instead of smelling it, he ate it. That happened to another survivor. Gosh. And what Um, kind of shape were they in? They were in awful shape. You know, they had terrible altitude sickness, they were dehydrated, they had frostbite, broken bones, immense scurvy, malnutrition. One of the worst affected was six feet tall and was weighing only 38 kilos, which is about five and a half stone, so he'd lost over half of his body weight. Mm. Uh, One had a broken leg and another broken hip. Gosh. So actually, one of them had had to just be dragging himself around the plane on a cushion for ages because he couldn't walk. And this this one really um, struck me, that one had actually lost part of his intestine from straining to go to the bathroom because obviously they were incredibly constipated during the whole... Process. Yeah. Was it only the living who were rescued and brought back to civilization? Yes, the bodies were left at that point because it was deemed too difficult to recover them. What was the reception like when they made it back? They were flown to Chile and they were met by their families. I mean, obviously, there was so much press and 
it was like a huge, a huge story. Mm. Obviously, it was a very happy story that these men had made it. But when the world learned about what they'd had to do to stay alive, the cannibalism, how was that received? So the rescuers who were on the helicopter had taken some photos of the fuselage. So it was obvious right away because we could see partially eaten human remains. And the men were very open about it. They told their families, they told the doctors. So the doctor asked one of them, what was the last thing you ate? And a survivor said human flesh. And was there a sort of bad reaction to all of that? Daniel was actually, I mean, he's very open about the fact that this is the reason why the story became famous, though he gets frustrated about the fact that he's constantly asked about it. That was the topic that the world was talking about, and that's why this story became famous. At any press conference, the first question was, what does the meat taste like? But he was talking to me about how some people were saying that they'd been excommunicated by the church, and he said that was utter nonsense, because actually Catholic theologians were saying that it was it was justified because they had to do what they did to survive. The Pope told us he would have excommunicated us if we had not used the bodies because then that would have been a collective suicide. Were the, the dead ever properly dealt with? The Uruguayan and Chilean Air Forces built a grave at the site and they held a ceremony there, and now there's a stone cross there with an inscription that says, El mundo a sus hermanos uruguayos cerca, o oh Dios de ti, which means the world to its Uruguayan brothers close, O oh God, to you. So now we've got this film, another film, the book, lots of reporting about it. Um, has Daniel and the other survivors seen this latest film? What yeah. do you make of it? They were really, really involved in it. They worked really closely with the director, Jay Bayona, and they have all seen it. But for Daniel, he says that they really captured what they went through. The film lasts two hours and 20 minutes. We were on the mountain for 72 days, but the director managed the miracle of putting everything in those two hours, 20 minutes. It's also amazing that the survivors, it seems like, for the most part, went on to live well-adjusted, successful lives. Yeah, they're doctors and agricultural technicians and successful businessmen. They have families. One is an academic, another is a painter. One of the medical students became an infant cardiologist and received a national award for medicine twice. He called his child Ilario after one of the mountains they climbed because he was one of the two who went on the expedition to safety. What do we know happened to Daniel in the end? Daniel worked in the Faculty of Agronomy in Montevideo. He also had a series of businesses. But also I asked him because, you know, if you've been through that situation, you're like, do you still fly? Mm. And he's like, yeah, I feel I feel safer in a plane than I do on a bus. And I also asked him if, if he'd ever been to a, a psychologist since coming back. And he said no, because all the therapy he needed, he'd done on the mountain. Did Daniel ever return to the crash site? No. So he has never been back, but quite a few of the survivors do still go. So it's kind of almost like a pilgrimage to some of them. And a really important and special part of their relationship is that every year, all of the survivors and their families still meet on the day that they were rescued. He called it a sacred event. And... I'm going to read out the, what he said to me specifically because it's quite moving. We are neither brothers nor friends. We are much more than either of those things. There is no word to describe the relationship we have. been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Luke Jones, and my guest, Blanca Schofield, Assistant Culture and Books Editor at The Times and The Sunday Times. 
You can find all of Blanca's work at thetimes.co.uk or by picking up a paper copy. The producer today was Olivia Case. The executive producers are Kate Ford and Fiona Leach. And sound design was by Hannah Varrell. If you've got a story that you think we should be doing, you can email us, storiesofourtimes at thetimes.co.uk. That's also where we very happily receive compliments and praise. See you soon. Thank you.